Was it easy to um, bring a culture of data ownership through an organization or is that something that is a, a challenge to, to say to people who maybe don't feel connected to, you know, there are many people who work in roles where they just don't feel connected to a database, but they realize data fuels their company. So how yeah. do you help them feel connected? Well, it's so tricky, isn't it? Because different people will view the same piece of data in different ways. Mm -hmm. So you get into debates like, when is a customer a customer, for example? We've all, we've all been there. Um, and you know, your top sales guy will say that a customer is the guy he's about to mm -hmm. sign next week, but he hasn't quite yet signed. But it, trust me, it's a customer. Your finance team will say mm -hmm. a customer isn't a customer until the check's cleared. You know? so, Getting really clear on that on that definition of, of, of all of your terms and, and what you all mean is, is is key. But then if you enable people to think about how they're going to use that data, those standardized mm -hmm. terms start to become more relevant and, uh, and meaningful rather than just another table and another set of policies and rules and regulations. Interestingly, and this is again, Tom and I have these discussions every now and then. Retail is a really good example of great use of data as a matter of interest. But so no data or not all data is the same, right? So you land in a company, in a bank, and data is just this amorphous, enormous thing that takes the shape of the thousands of databases when it's nice and square, um, you know, files when it's not very square, uh, you know, just pure text, as Tom and I have experienced in our previous lives, where it's just blah, it's just blah. Um, and, uh, and we tend to speak about it at a high level that we do today in a very holistic way, like all this is stuff exploitable. And, and the truth is, it translates to some, some, and I'm going to say this in the most generous way, some poor IT people who are actually translating this amorphous uh, data as a value to, OK, in order to try and do what you think you want to do, I can't take this thing and, you, and store it the way you're asking me. I can't. I can't take uh, a database, and I can't ask it intelligent questions that the database doesn't answer. I can't, uh, the example you and I were talking about before, I can't put all the knowledge of a firm that is unstructured text and stuff like that into what, a search engine and hope the thing is going to give me an answer. Won't work. So this, this, for me, this disconnect is fundamental. The data education for me is part of decrypting that. It is a, hey, we all, we got these things called legacy systems where we, they were systems of record, you know, we added the customer name and it went in there and it was all good, life was good. And then we've got the evolution over time of how we want to use that. And that thing no longer works the way we want to, but it still keeps track of something. So we need to evolve that data. So the bigger the company, the more these flavors exist. The more these issues exist. The big data revolution of let's stick everything in this lake thing obviously has more or less failed. But again, because you were trying to move everything from their place to a place mm -hmm. without, in most cases, thinking, how can I extract it? Tom, your example of retail is fabulous in the sense that actually it's such a lifeblood that all of this is kind of working. But in most other places, it's the, and the next evolution is now, there's this cloud thing. Let's take this amorphous thing again without the right questions, to your point, Sarah, the questions we ask, which are the important thing. And let's just move it over there because we're going to be able to answer these questions. And this whole cycle is, is, is yeah. fairly brutal. And I think one of the things that uh, when, when you're talking about organizations and their journeys, okay, um, you can talk about data, but it's actually more useful to talk about data as a product or sets of products because then it takes this amorphous blob of data, right, and actually makes it concrete to a business function to that end user, that person that uses Excel, right, or use, you, you know, do, does their business role daily because now I have a product that resides in a business function and it's governed by a certain set of rules, right? But like, you know, in, in the more general sense, when we talk about data, okay, uh, we can bring it through sort of a data governance mechanism, right? And that's sort of the, the beginnings of a company on that data journey, yeah. because governance doesn't really mean data literacy in, in a certain right. sense, right? Mm -hmm. You don't gain data literacy by pushing down right. governance, because governance is a bad word, right? What you really want to do is make it relevant for the business, that business function say, you know, here's the governance, right? But the reason why there's the governance is because you're creating data products that you use in your everyday, you know, work. Work, right. right? So, so that's context, right? That's context. But then the scaffolding. Yes. Yeah. So then the scaffolding is you do need governance as a piece of your scaffolding or you're in big trouble. You need quality 
you need ingestion, you need prioritization. You need, so there's a bunch of, these are very, you guys know, these are data specific things, but um, we haven't got an A plus in, in scaffolding, never mind in filling then the scaffolding, yeah. right? Which is the scaffolding, the product is all of it. So I'm totally with you when there's a product, but again, retail is such a great example of things that work in most cases, uh, you know, because if the bananas all go rotten, you ain't got a business. But in other places, it seems to be the secondary concern. So turning it back and saying, what are the products and services that you could build and should build that are driven by data? It seems to be a better pattern of solving and building a scaffolding than build the scaffolding and they will come. I think you lose your energy. You can never sustain the energy. And for that, you, and you never get there. Uh, yeah, and you, d you just don't get there. Um, and I think that's right. And I think you can take the questioning even further upstream. So if you, if you start by thinking, what are we trying to achieve as an organisation? What are our strategic goals? And to what extent will our use of data influence them and, and, and improve on them? And sometimes data won't be the answer, uh, but usually it will. Um, so don't start with data as the end. Uh, start with what you're trying to achieve. Is, is, and then you get pull through. Then, then you start to think, right, okay, how can we now do this? Uh, you know, a completely different example where actually data as a valuable asset but not necessarily with pound signs attached to it is in the world of health and safety mm. so uh, one of my previous organizations health and safety was everything and it was the single most important strategic goal how do we achieve a, a, a corporate strategy of zero harm to our people mm. um, and then we asked ourselves how could we use data to achieve that can we should we try to use data and initially we weren't immediately clear how but then developed some really interesting proofs of concept where we got to the stage where we could predict uh, to the date time physical location location on the plant to the nearest body part what particular injury might in be inflicted on a particular person as they carried out a particular piece of work on a particular given day and that meant that we could give better training in advance of them doing that piece of work and that was through taking a ton of historical data and running the algorithms so what an interesting way of being able to actually say here's data as a method of, of achieving a, a strategic goal that's got nothing to do with pounds but it's much more important. But you're back to DNA right? right so if you're talking about energy companies or gas and oil companies where if you've never worked in one you go to one of their offices you're going up the stairs and somebody will literally say get Holds your hand handrail. hold the handrail you got it and they're not saying it because it's a it literally is embedded in the dna they, they mean it yeah. put your hand on it so uh, i think you've touched on something really important which is if you try if once you start getting into this if you do attach your products to something that is part of the dna yeah people come with you this is not a foreign concept safety is such an important thing we actually honest to god care so much that again another example from that industry is you start every meeting with a note on not what is health and safety it's my own personal experience of health and safety this week yeah. i was driving down the road and i saw yeah. this and I said, it's really so that's fundamental i really like that example but not all industries have a guiding north star that is such a strong thing okay. think about industries i don't know Think about financial services where the product you're creating is slightly difficult to even understand. It's a compound of other financial instruments and you get these, you separate yourself from the reality of the world. So how can you motivate people to do that? And there it requires, a, and I call it the CIO conundrum, which is the CIO saying, this day to day has value, I know it has value. Okay, good luck. Good luck, it doesn't always have value. So there I think it requires leaders to have an even, even more clarity around what they're looking for and ways to, to explain it. Your example is brilliant, but you're sitting there trying to define how to optimize a trading floor. And it might well be, actually, all, uh, this is a real example, you know, most traders are, are good at their job, but they're running so fast, they don't always kind of close their paperwork and stuff. What, if we could kind of go behind and, and you know, try to help them, hey, you've closed this set of trades, you know, have you done the paperwork, you know, could we do it for them? That's a brilliant example of some of these non-fabricated real examples in complex scenarios. Yeah. Most of my experience with data, when you actually look at the list of things people want to do with them, there's a large percentage of use cases where it's just, it lacks that clarity of your example mm -hmm. on safety. Yeah. So we shouldn't be surprised that then all of the execution is very tough yeah. when you can't relate to the problem. Again, Tommy, the problem is it's in your world, it's relatable almost mm -hmm. every time. And people get it so much in healthcare. Yeah. It's you know, immediately relatable. So I mean, my question for you, Sarah, though, is in, even then in, in healthcare, we don't always see it, see it working, sure. for example, right? So, 
Clarity of purpose then is, is, is your point, being really clear on what questions you're, you're, you're yeah. trying to answer. But then of course the power of data can then be the flip side of that same question, which is what are the questions that you aren't able to even contemplate today that you might be able to contemplate tomorrow with the use of data? And that's asking a lot of your organisation to start being able to, to think like that. I, I think though, sorry, I, I think that's where um, there's, there's a different aspect and it's more technical aspect of a data scaffolding, okay. right? Because um, uh, how a customer or, or a data product is represented in each business function would actually potentially be very different. But what you want to do is keep the core elements of it pure, mm -hmm. right? So that if the business evolves over time, mm -hmm. right, you still have something to come back to, right? Like a version zero of your data, right? Of your, your, of your data product. Because this is where, you know, um, from the, you call it the raw data, right? You, you have to be able to make sure that you can explore new avenues with that, yeah? So like this is where, once again, a more technical aspect of the scaffolding really does come into place, right? And right. you can call it governance or whatnot. But, you know, in order to make sure that the data is ready, right, yeah. for anything in the future, you all, I think it's, I, I know Fernando just said, data lakes don't work. I think that's where the data like yours works does come in, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. and the foundations have to be secure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And then you've got the time variable of, of value, which is, is, is I've lived the last week. So when you have people that say, "Well, I need to be using real time data," and obviously all the people that but back to our scaffolding, our technology scaffolding, people look at each other going, "Oh my god, these people are mad. You know, they don't even know what they're talking about." So taking away the idea of real time being actual real time as human beings would understand it, but quicker, righter it becomes again a, a bit of a fad. Uh, how much data can you literally use in real time that somebody would care about that time element? Mm -hmm. How much of that is, is, is putting a lot of pressure on the firm to build a scaffolding that is just immensely complex to deal with our real time problem without the clarity of vision of why you need it? Yeah. So, and it's, and it's really easy to fall into that trap where you think, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bank, for example, and I want to be able to, to delight my customer with uh, real-time moments. Get it. How many real-time moments matter? Yeah. You know, and you start going, if you go deep there, to your point before, so you go really deep into that, what really matters is important so you don't end up with, in the case of real-time data, which is really difficult and costly, with an enormous technology framework to deal with, that might be over-engineered, maybe that's and no longer proportionate.